Welcome to the monthly MinStack Forum. If you're new to the MinStack Forums, please uh, take some time to consider becoming a member of MinStack and signing up for our weekly newsletter where you'll get announcements about the forums and other things that are happening in culture and urban forestry throughout Minnesota. This forum is being recorded and you can view it on our YouTube channel at, along with previous forums. I'm gonna put the uh, YouTube link in the chat. So if you're not familiar or haven't been, you can also subscribe to that channel and you'll get notifications about any time we post new videos for either forums or other training or informational uh, videos that we produce. I also wanted to let everybody know about the Minnesota Shade Tree Short Course. There have been a few people that were on earlier uh, before we started the forum. Um, chatting about whether or not the short course will be in person. Our plan is that the, the short course will be in person this year. We've got a great uh, schedule of speakers lined up and there'll be more information that coming out. You may have, some of you may have already received information and I've put a link to the short course uh, page in uh, website in the chat. So please take a look at that and save the dates. It'll be March 15th and 16th of 2022. I want to introduce today Brian Schwingel is a, a forest health specialist with the Minnesota DNR for the central region of Minnesota, which is basically uh, the bottom half of the state. So from, from about where we are here in the Twin Cities all the way down. So it's quite a large region. He's been a regular speaker for the Minnesota Tree Inspector Education events and at the Minnesota Shade Tree Short Course. Brian completed his Master's of Science under Bob Blanchett in the University of Minnesota Department of Plant Pathology. And Brian's favorite tree, I've been told, is the Burr Oaks. I hope that's true. And Brian, if you're ready, we're, we're very excited to have you here today. So thank you. And you can go ahead and share your screen. So can everyone see my screen? Yeah, that looks good. Fantastic. OK. All right. Thank you, Brian. Right. I, I will uh, just so you know, I, I'll try to answer some or watch the chat for you and keep track of questions as we go. And then at the at the end, if there's time, I'll, I'll help kind of go through those chat questions for you. And without any more from me, please. All right. All right. So um, my computer locked up at 1002. So I don't know what all Eric told you, but here the forest health team is. I know he explained to you my territory is that light blue there at the bottom. Um, just a tiny bit about what we do. Our bread and butter is we investigate uh, tree health mysteries for foresters. Um, we primarily work on state lands. There's a lot of state forests. I think there's something like 4 million acres. So I spend about 60% of my time dealing with DNR staff. Um, and so our bread and butter is just going out and helping land managers figure out what's killing the trees. We also get a big grant from the United States Forest Service. Um, to monitor and evaluate the forests in, in, a, in a very general way. And we do that with aerial survey. There's nothing cheaper and faster than aerial survey um, to cover the entire state. So there's the 2018 flight tracks. The green is done by the US Forest Service. We do the brown. And then here, here's where we surveyed in 2021. And again, this is a very general um, course survey. All right, so um, let's talk about what I, I found and experienced in the woods in 2021 and a little bit about what my teammates found too and a tiny bit about what we saw in the air. So as you all know, 2021 was dry. Now I am obsessed with looking at weather stuff. DNR puts out this, the climate group puts out these precipitation ranking maps. And so here's a shot of the, of the entire growing season defined April through September, let's say. And um, this ranks all time how dry it was or wet it was. And so you can see, and, and records go back to 1895. So you can see that the areas in brown there, they were in the top five driest on the record. Um, so you can see the Northern half of Minnesota and a big part of the central part of the state and South Central Minnesota were extremely di dry for the entire growing season. But of course, um, it, drought is highly variable. I think overall, Minnesota received um, its ninth least amount of rain in the growing season. But I mean, it, it was highly variable, as you saw in that map. 
And then of course, drought has different effects on trees depending on when it occurs. Um, so the question I, I like to ask, so for April through June, let's just call that spring, when was it drier in the different climate zones in Minnesota? And I've grayed out the West Central and Southwest. I, I haven't looked at those, um, but just in these other parts. So the last time it was drier from April through June in, in these parts of Minnesota, as you can see, you know, 1992 to 2009, East Central, Central, Northeast, Southeast, North Central. Um, it, it, the last time it was drier in the spring in Northwestern Minnesota and South Central Minnesota was the infamous drought of 1988. Um, looking a little bit further into this, though, in northeastern Minnesota, where there was that really big fire that I'm sure you all heard about, that they, they experienced their fourth straight dry spring, and in north central and northwestern, that was their sixth straight dry spring. On the other side of the spectrum, it was the first dry spring below the long-term average for the first time in 12 years in southeastern Minnesota. It's been wet down there. What about kind of the, the, the late summer or early fall, July through September. When was it drier last? Um, it's not as impressive when you take a look at the drought extremes in the latter ha half of the growing season. So in, in it was either above average or normal, basically normal in central, south central, southeastern part of the state. But it was, you know, it was, we haven't experienced a drought for a while in east central Minnesota in terms of late summer drought. It was last time they experienced a drier drought in North Central was in 1990. Interestingly, in East Central Minnesota, um, including you know Hennepin, Ramsey, uh, Washington counties, and North, that was the first dry, below average summer we've experienced in eight years. It's been wet. What about the whole growing season? This is where it gets quite impressive. Last time it was drier in the southern half of the state was 2009 or 2012 in southeastern Minnesota. Up north, was the, the last time it was drier was the infamous drought in 1976. And even worse for north central Minnesota, it was crazy dry in north central Minnesota, 1936. Some fun factoids, again, northeastern Minnesota experienced its fourth consecutive dry growing season. And in, in central Minnesota, it was the first dry growing season in 12 years. First dry growing season in nine years in southeastern Minnesota. Okay, also, and very important for tree health, June was very hot. How hot was it? Well, <clears throat> this map comes from Oregon State University. They got a cool website called the PRISM website. website. Um, and this shows the, the deviation from the normal, it's like the 30 year normal for June. And as you can see, um, most of the Southern half of the state was five to seven degrees warmer than the average in June. When was it last hotter in June though, I ask? Um, and this is the average temperature, not the, the high average, not the low average, the average temperature for the, for the month. Um, so last time it was hotter in June in these parts of Minnesota that you can see is 1988 or 1995. But it gets really impressive when you take a look at East Central and Southeastern Minnesota. The last time it was hotter was in 1933. So it was hot. Okay. So on to kind of tree health, the, the observations I made. Um, so that June period in particular resulted in leaf scorching. Here's the bur oak in my yard. Um, I left in early June and everything was kind of, I, I took a little vacation in June. Everything was, it was dry, it was hot, but nothing concerning. And I came home and I'm like, my bur oak doesn't have oak wilt, but oh my gosh, what's going on here? Kind of looked like oak wilt, seeing all these leaves on the ground. Um, when you took, took th this occurred in a few bur oaks that I saw, and when you look exactly where the leaves, where the tree shed its leaves, it wasn't the very end of the branches. It was, it was in it, down the branch from the very terminal leaves, and it caused a lot of leaf loss. It happened in late June. Um, here's a shot of a sugar maple showing what I'll call leaf scorch in late June 2. This was in central Minnesota, northeastern. If you look really closely, you'll see dried sugar maple leaves all over the, all over the ground. Um, and then um, there's a red maple sapling on the left from St. Paul. Burr oak seedlings in the middle there in Sherburne County, um, all in late June. And then leaf loss on, on lindens 
in the Southeast. So a wide variety of trees were showing the same symptoms. That's indicative of an environmental cause. And um, reading the old reports from 1988, this happened in 1988 too, after an extremely hot spell in late July or early August. So I attribute, this is, you know, uh, a broadleaf losing its leaves, it's an adaptation to losing moisture. They can serve, they're able to use less moisture if they have less leaf area. Um, and if we, if we use history as a lesson, most of these trees will survive. Okay. So that wasn't, I mean, that was worrisome. It was shocking, but it's not the most worrisome. Now I'm gonna talk about the worst of things. So the, the drought was the straw that broke the camel's back um, in many instances. So I'm not sure this first example in central Minnesota, it was shocking in late June, early July. Um, we, we were doing starting to do our surveys, getting reports from a lot of rural homeowners. And I went up there for a day and I thought, wow, oak wilt is going crazy everywhere. And then I, I, you know, at the end of the day, I, I sat back and thought that that's impossible. Oak wilt can't all of a sudden appear across the landscape over such a wide area. And when I started taking a look at the common factors, all of these bur oaks that rapidly had their oaks, their crowns turn color and drop a massive amount of leaves, um, they were all in current pastures or recent pastures and all in areas that had um, recent flooding. Um, and, but the, these, you know, the symptoms were shocking. And as you can see in the picture on the right, it really looked a lot like, like oak wilt. You saw some green leaves falling. A lot of the leaves had bronze margins. I was convinced finally it wasn't oak wilt when I found a, a Amalankir little tree that was showing the exact same symptoms as these oaks. Um, here's just another shot of a, a very common scene um, in late June. Now, will some of these were some of these being attacked by two-line chestnut bor? Possibly, but I, I think this was just kind of a physiological reaction to heat and drought. So, it, like I said, it occurred in all over Morrison County, probably beyond too. It mimicked oak wilt, like just about the best mimic of oak wilt symptoms I've ever seen. Um, all of these areas have exp experienced excessive precipitation and flooding in the last decade. Um, 2014, 2017, 2019, they all ranked in the top 10 for all time precipitation in the growing season in this area. Um, so when, when you think about what drought does to trees, and I'll touch on this in a little bit too, or compaction, it kills fine roots. If a tree doesn't have as many fine roots as it normally would, it's going to have a harder time getting moisture during drought. Okay. I, I think a lot of these trees will die in, in the next couple of years though. Okay. Moving on here. I, I bear, let's see, how many trees did I see? This might've been only two cases where I saw rapid death of sugar maple. Like, the only time I've ever seen sugar maple, so I started my career in 2007. The only time I've seen sugar maples rapidly die like this was in um, extreme cases of sap streak disease in sugar bushes. Um, but I saw rapid death. I couldn't attribute it to stem girdling roots, but I can't rule that out. Um, so this was in Carver County at Baylor Regional Park in a campground. Um, I did find a pathogen on these trees that I found before. It's called stegon, stegon sporium. And if you look closely at that segment of that sugar maple branch that came from the tree on the left, you'll see these black, pretty big black like warts almost. That's stegon sporium, which is an opportunistic canker pathogen. It kills bark tissue that's really stressed. Um, so it, you know, if you saw this, Maybe it, it was due to the combination of compaction, the drought, stuck on sporium, maybe stem girdling roots too. There are other canker pathogens that can do this to maples too. And again, I saw this rarely. What I saw a lot more commonly in my neighborhood in the Southeast Metro was 
um, maples, not necessarily sugar maples, but kind of urban maples, whatever those are, you guys would know better than me. Um, a lot of those maples that died back suddenly in 2019, presumably from lack of snow cover in winter, late winter 2018, um, a lot of those died back suddenly in 2019. They seem to somewhat recover in 2020 or stabilize, but this late June and July, they just continued to die back at a pretty quick rate. And, and I think some of them in my neighborhood anyways, in the South Metro, they're gonna die. Um, you know, is it the majority of maples? Absolutely not. Um, but it's, you know, to people like us, highly noticeable. Um, I know this also happened in Crow Wing County, presumably Brainerd country, um, and then in, to urban maples. And I also, our DNR forester down in Mankato also reported this or really rapid leaf loss too in, in the Mankato zone. This picture on the left is from 2019. So if you can imagine this tree on the left with that, with that dead half, you know, in 2021, the rest, a, a big portion of the crown all continued to die you know, with dead orange leaves hanging on it in July. Okay, so that was I covered the bur oak, pasture bur oaks. I covered the stressed urban maples or campground maples. Here's the next topic. And this happened all over kind of north, central, east central Minnesota, previously flooded trees. Um, a lot of them died pretty quickly in summer 2021. Um, Here's a shot of you know, a wetland in Morrison County, central Minnesota, and all around it, you had red oaks dying. And I don't know if these are northern reds or northern pins, pins or hybrids of them, um, but it, you know, these, a lot of these trees looked like they died in a single growing season, but I strongly suspect that most of these trees that died actually had die back in 2020 already from extreme flooding that occurred in you know, 14, 17, 19, maybe 16 too. Um, and here's, a, here's another case. Now this is a kind of a rich, a rich um, kind of Northern red oak, sugar maple, basswood forest in Mille Lacs County near Onania. Um, and this forest, the landowner noticed uh, suddenly dead and dying oaks this summer. And I took, a, I actually um, saw on a realty website, a neighboring property that was for sale and they took a, a drone image of the surrounding landscape. And there was definitely an outbreak of two-line chestnut borer going on. Two-line chestnut borer is that little insect larva that you can see on the right and it's feeding tunnels or galleries or on the, on the right. They look kind of like Etch-a-Sketch marks. Um, but Again, the, what I noticed in this woods is these trees actually had been dying previously. It's just that the property owner hadn't noticed it. Um, a lot of these oaks that looked like that on the left, they were in an area of the forest that was slightly depressed and clearly flooded in prior years. Now in this, in this county, the, again, they set top 10 records for precipitation in 2010, 2016, 2014. 2019 was number 11 all time. So again, the, the, all the prior floods, and as we know, you know, floods, droughts, they affect trees for, for several years after that major stress event. And if you have another stress, different type of stress occurring after the original stress, like drought following flood, it's that much worse. I saw pines in pine plantations in Pine County, ironically Pine County, um, a lot of them were, were just petering out that were right at the edge of wetlands that presumably had been larger and possibly, you know, flooding some of their roots in prior years. Okay. Okay, so th those were kind of the, the last drop for some of those trees, if you will. Now I'm gonna talk about what, what I'm expecting next year because of the drought. I definitely expect some pines in North Central Minnesota, um, um, possibly northeastern Minnesota to to die. They, they'll look like they'll die this winter, but actually they're standing dead right now. Um, on many conifers, they're actually the, the 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 crown does not turn 
does not appear dead, like you can see in the upper left there. Um, it, it turns brown and, and orange, like well after all of the cambium has been consumed, or essentially all of it. It's pretty remarkable how, the, and that's what my counterpart up in, in Bemidji country noticed. She, she went out to some of these plantations that were, they looked green, um, but the but the many of these green red pines were full of of bark beetles and they actually had blue stain in them already. Blue stain is a caused by a fungus that bark beetles carry to um, to trees and essentially inoculate the trees with this blue stain fungus. Um, but I expect a lot of pines and or some pines, maybe a lot in north central Minnesota to to appear to die over this winter. That also happened in. 1988, I believe, or winter 87, 88, I forget which. Um, but you know, the, the, the pictures on the bottom just show signs of bark beetles. So they, they read these characteristic tunnels that you can see on the right. And when a, when a bark beetles are done with the pine, they'll leave all these exit holes like you can see there in the, in the central bottom picture. But, you know, general recommendations for pines, and this, this goes for the entire state, this goes for urban areas, and this goes for all conifers, to tell you the truth, because all conifers can rap rapidly be attacked by bark beetles. Um, if, they, if they're sickly, you know, if, they, if half their crown's dead or if, if their crown is very un, unhealthfully thin, cut them down this winter, get rid of them before April, chip up the wood. If you're able to do that before April, you've eliminated a food source for bark beetles in 2022. Um, the main uh, bark beetle of our pines, Ips pinei, also Ips grandiculus, um, they overwinter in the duff. So it's not like if you cut, it's not like you can get rid of infested trees over the winter. You basically remove their food source for the next year. Um, and again, I'm going to mention this a few times, and probably some of you in the audience know have a lot more experience with this and know how, but the general you know, rule of thumb is to water trees during dry periods. So when, when you get to an inch or more below the average for the month, it's time to water, water at your drip line, water really slow, using the drip hose is, is a good way to go and up for a long time. Infrequently, like once a week, once every two weeks, that'll go a long ways at preventing a lot of problems that that take advantage of drought stress trees. I expect a lot of oaks to die in 2022, 2023. The last time, you know, the last time I experienced a drought with this was in 2012. Extremely dry, late, late summer, early fall. Um, that happened in 2012, and we saw a, a big time outbreak of two line chestnut borer from central to northwestern Minnesota um, that occurred from 2014 ish through 2017, I'd say. Um, now, you know, you have these two native pests, armillaria being a disease, there are a couple different species of it, a few different species of armillaria, and then two-line chestnut borer, which is a flat-headed wood borer. It's a, like in the same family as armillash borer, but it's native. Um, these two critters are notorious for attacking drought-stressed oaks after the drought or heavily defoliated oaks after the defoliation. Um, oftentimes they, you'll find armillaria and two line chestnut borer on the same dying oak um, and they're opportunists. Meaning that if the tree isn't stressed, you generally aren't going to find problems due to armillaria and two line chestnut borer. Um, sometimes you can find them working solo, like the picture on the left there is an understory, or not an understory, but slightly shaded forest grown red oak in Stearns County that I photographed this year. There were no signs of two line chestnut borer on this tree, um, just on malaria, but it looked like it, it died over the course of a couple of years. Picture on the right is, is a yard red oak down in Wabashaw County that I photographed this August. That's classic symptom development for two line chestnut borer, where it kills like the top half of the tree one year and then it'll kill the rest of the tree the following year. Um, again, here are signs of two-lane chestnut borer. There's a, a larva on the picture on the left, which with typical kind of etch-a-sketch etch type galleries, they leave D-shaped exit holes. Um, once they've emerged from the tree, 
Um, like you can see on the right, the D-shaped exit holes, if you're, if you're experienced with ML lash bore, they're, they're significantly smaller than ML lash bore exit holes, I would say. Um, and then of course here, signs of armillaria. Armillaria creates these white sheets between the bark and the cambium. Um, they're a lot easier to see on conifers. Armillary will attack just about any tree I'm aware of. They're a lot easier to see on conifers than on, than on hardwood trees. Um, but here's a sh uh, what, they, what these white sheets look like. They're called mycelial fans on oak on the right there. Um, and then <laughs> they, this, this fungus also forms these like shoestring-like like, um, structures that are survival structures and enable it to move through the soil without growing on a host. Um, and sometimes you can see oaks like the one on the left and you can see that black like hair hanging off the oak those are just armillaria's rhizomorphs. It's pretty remarkable how um, thick they can get on oak. Um, okay, so what do you do about this? Well, I'm sure many of you are, I mean, you know, again, your world is urban tree care, ornamental tree care. That's not really, that's not my world. So I, I can just speak in generalities. Um, there is some overlap. Okay. My, I'm, I'm, I apologize here, I'm giving my computer a second to think. It seems to be paused right now. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm not sure about that. Brian, yes, can, we, we, we can hear you, Brian. Oh, okay, thanks. Your Eric. screen looks like it's a little frozen, but we can still hear you. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm going to stop. Oh, there we go. I'm going to stop my video. And here we go. So hopefully you can see this. And again, this is, this is just stuff that I'm sure most of you are aware of, but you know, mulching trees helps conserve soil moisture, amongst other things. Fertilizing trees, um, could, you know, my understanding with, with fertilizing plants is if a plant is stressed, you really don't want to fertilize it in a way that encourages shoot growth. Because if you encourage shoot growth, that puts greater water demand on the tree. And if the tree was, has fewer roots than it normally would due to past root damage from flooding, from drought, it's just not going to be able to get enough water. So if you're able to avoid fertilizing, I would recommend doing that. And I mentioned watering trees already, you know, infrequently, slowly, deeply, really soak that, that soil um, every so often. That's the way to water trees. And just a note here, if you're um, an arborist and you're um, injecting preventative insecticides, into a tree, say, to protect it from emerald ash borer attack or to protect it from two-line chestnut borer attack, those insecticides might work to protect the tree from attack of insects, but they certainly aren't going to protect the roots from attack by armillaria. So it would still be very important to water the trees um, for that reason, amongst other reasons too. And um, back to you know the flat-headed wood borers like two-line chestnut borer. There, there are many flat line or flat-headed um, flat-headed wood borers that attack various broadleaf trees in the state. Like here's a picture of a trembling aspen on the right that's under attack by bronze poplar borer. It's also atta under attack by armillaria. But you know, paper birch is frequently attacked by bronze birch borer. If you're able to get rid of, you know, trees that showed symptoms of boar attack, so significant branch dieback in 2021, if you're able to get rid of those trees this winter and chip them up before May, you're going to end up killing thousands of thousands of um, flat-headed wood boars that would otherwise emerge in May or maybe early June and attack the nearest stressed tree. So I'd recommend getting rid of really sick trees this winter. Okay. That's, I'm sorry, everyone. I'm just, 
it was it was working great up until a couple minutes ago. I don't know why that happened. But there we go. Okay. So another issue I foresee is is that it's very it is it is really hard to tell the difference between two line chestnut borer and old world. Um, I, I mean extremely difficult on white oak, still extremely difficult on bur oak, and even on the red oaks. I mean, if you aren't there right when symptoms are, are flashing before your eyes, it is difficult. Um, and so here are just some, some tidbits or some thoughts. Um, two land chestnut borer can kill really stressed oaks in one growing season. Um, the key, what I think the key differentiator to look for is rapid leaf loss. If you're seeing rapid leaf loss, like this picture on the ab above that was taken in late June in Lebanon Hills in Egan, right under an, a tree with oak wilt, um, and the bottom picture, I forget where I took that, but you know, if you're, if you're in a wooded area, you'll see with oak wilt, you'll see leaves that have rapidly come off the tree. There's a carpet of leaves that is strongly, strongly suggestive of oak wilt. So if that's happening May through August, you have a, you can be pretty confident that's oak wilt. But if you don't see that, like in this shot um, back in like 2015 in Crow Wing or Cass County up by Brainerd, you can't be sure. It's just so hard it, because these trees, it's like, well, the, the tree on the left there, hopefully maybe you can see my cursor, that tree on the left, it sure looks like oak wilt. Um, from the road. But if you walk up to that tree, there's like one little branch living down here with zero symptoms. And so if you went back in two weeks and looked for oak wilt symptoms and there were none, then you can probably be pretty confident that that was past two line chestnut borer damage. Again, this was all two line chestnut borer. And it is just so difficult to differentiate these two if you're in, a, in an area that's been devastated by two line chestnut borer, um, or if you just aren't there when when oak wilt symptoms are active. So I suggest getting a lab test from the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Clinic. Um, you know, in kind of normal situations where the, where the oak is not, ex, wasn't extremely stressed, you get this pattern of, of two line chestnut borer attack that's kind of a dead part at the outer crown that was killed last year, a red part or orange part that is actively was actively infested this year and then a green part at, at, towards the base of the canopy that isn't showing symptoms of attack yet that's that's like classic two-line chestnut borer different color arrows indicating different years of symptom development whereas with oak wilt on the right in one year but like in one to two months you just get rapid leaf color change and rapid leaf loss 90 percent leaf loss okay so now I'm going to cover some, some fun stuff that wasn't necessarily due to the drought, although drought affects all pests and their behavior. Um, so this is really fascinating to me. And I, I actually got my first um, report in the last month of this happening in kind of an urban situation. But, but like I said, I started my career in 2007. You know, it's common for forest cell specialists with DNRs to get um, concerned forest owners calling us like in February or March about what's hurting my, sh my, my sugar maples. And as you can see on the picture on the left, all of those sugar maples missing their bark. If you look close, you'll see the teeth, teeth scrapes from, from squirrels eating the bark. But I have never seen anything like this year. And I've never gotten early, re early reports. My first report was from central Minnesota um, squirrel feeding in mid-January. I've never gotten a report that early. And um, John Ball at South Dakota State reported around January 1st squirrel damage over in, in South Dakota. Um, when I was, I, I did a couple aerial surveys this year and I couldn't believe all this sugar maple flagging I saw. And I couldn't, I didn't think it was necessary. I didn't think it was squirrel damage. I wondered if it was, but I thought, no, that must be something else. So you can see in this picture right here, um, whoops, get that out of the way. Well, sorry, I'm having troubles with my controls here. Um, all of these flagging sugar maples, actually it, it goes 
way up here. I mean, all over there's sugar maples all over um, that are flagging. And on the, on, I visited several spots or just tripped across several spots in the course of doing other work. And sure enough, it was squirrel feeding. And, and it's, it's a lot harder to identify squirrel feeding in the summer because that, that exposed um, sapwood discolors pretty quick and almost matches the bark color, color. But on this flagging sugar maple in the woods, I've kind of doctored up the video so you can see up here, sure enough, there's all this missing bark from, from squirrel feeding. Um, you know, John Ball um, suggested maybe the maybe weather events in 2020 um, encouraged higher sugar content in sap. And just before this presentation, I was talking with uh, one of our wildlife biologists who taps his sugar maple, and he said he he tested his his sap content and it was higher than he's ever tested before. So maybe um, Professor Ball is absolutely right about that. I really wonder about past acorn crops. Um, I, the, the Minnesota DNR wildlife section actually um, tracks black bear food abundance in the state. They've been doing that since like 1985. And indeed, in 2018, in the areas where I saw all this um, sugar maple damage from squirrels, the acorn index was highest. It, it, was, it was its record high all time since records are being tracked or second highest in central Minnesota in 2018. So I do wonder if that really promoted some sort of squirrel population explosion. Anyways, that was kind of the, the fun thing, <laughs> not really concerning, you know, but um, it was just an interesting thing that happened this year. Also an interesting thing, first time I've seen this in Minnesota, this has happened in Minnesota before, certainly. Um, first time that I've seen it since I started here in 2014, but introduced basswood thrips outbreak. In, in the shaded counties in central Minnesota, you can see here. Um, and heavily impacted basswoods looked like this at the, at the beginning of June. Um, we got some extremely heavy defoliation in um, far northern Stearns County in our Birch Lakes State Forest. And um, hopefully the next picture will load here. My computer's having a hard time forwarding to the next slide. There we go. Um, so basically the, the damage looks like uh, spring frost damage. You can see there um, in, the, in the middle cent top picture. Um, sometimes the, the leaves get uh, a scorched appearance to them. And the thing is that there are these, these thrips that are causing this damage and they're super tiny. You can see one right here on my thumbnail, another one on the end of my thumb, you can see a bunch on the lower right of this pic, this image here. They're just these very narrow, tiny insects. And there are a couple, there is a native basswood thrips, um, but I identified these thrips and they weren't that. There's also a pair of thrips that can damage basswood. They weren't that, they were introduced basswood thrips. Um, so again, the, the damage looks like frost damage kind of. Um, basswoods, like all hardwoods, they can tolerate a lot of leaf feeding. At, um, for consecutive years, sometimes basswoods relief. I've, I've not heard of this affecting any yard ornamental basswoods or lindens, but it could happen. And you know, the thing that I would recommend is just standard TLC for those, those trees to, to help them leaf out, just making sure they have proper enough, enough water. Um, oak wilt crept north, unfortunately. Um, here was the high risk map being high risk if you wound an oak April through July, the, the blue area on this map on the left. That was last year at this time. Move ahead this year, um, and these, these orange triangles represent oak wilt confirmations that expanded that high risk area. So unfortunately, we found one over here in an isolated zone in northwestern Pine County, and um, we found these from reports and aerial survey. Um, between Pillager and Baxter, um, and then on the south side of Gull Lake. Really unfortunate that's in cabin country. Um, so that's just a bummer. Um, Morrison County SW Soil and Water Conservation District has a big grant from LCCMR to, to fund oak wilt control on private property in, in Morrison County and North. So there's a lot of control going on here. There's a lot of control going on in Pine County from about you know, the, the northern two-thirds of Pine County northwards through a different um, 
different means. Burrow blight, not surprisingly, was not a problem. The, all these in 2021, all these uh, percentages represent uh, surveys of a bunch of bur oaks in, at those points uh, where we, we mark them as defoliated if they are missing due to bur oak blight 50% or more of their crown. And as you can see in most of Minnesota, they're, they're 0%, 3% um, here in a case in a, in a park in Hastings, 2% at a roadside rest stop here in Goodhue County, 3% in, in um, Sibley State Park. All of these oaks though, that we counted as having defoliation in early September due to burrow flight, they're stressed. They're stressed for a variety of reasons. And so I just, you know, from doing these surveys year after year after year, it, it's, it seems apparent to me that uh, like any sort of stress, like extremely compacted soils, um, you know, in a pasture that's grazed, they, they're just, they just seem extremely susceptible to burrow flight, even with, even in dry, dry maze. Now here at a, at a city park in Stacy, here's a burrow. Now this was, this is, I, I do a survey. I've done a survey at this park for a few years in a row. And um, as you can see at that park, I found no oaks defoliated over 50%. That was in early September. Now, a month later in mid-October, there's one, one oak here that, that definitely has symptoms of burrow blight. Um, but again, it, it's growing in this kind of suboptimal area. And this oak, I'm sure it will, it will tolerate Baroque blight for a lot decades. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm just not worried about Baroque blight. A um, little note on emerald ash borer distribution. Uh, the red counties in Minnesota are quarantined for emerald ash borer. Um, basically no ash can move outside of that quarantine zone. Um, the gray areas are considered generally infested in Minnesota. Wisconsin tracks emerald ash borer by township. Um, and they're grayed in over there. And you can see this is 14 to 15 years after emerald ash borer was discovered in these states. Um, and so that's, that's what we're looking at for emerald ash borer. It, you know, it's not, whenever there's a new confirmation of, oak, of emerald ash borer, it doesn't surprise me. Um, but it is kind of satisfying, I must say, to see that it's not just ra racing northwards quickly. So I think uh, Minnesota managers at all different kinds of levels and citizens are, are doing well in terms of slowing the spread of MLH ash borer. Um, okay, just a, a, a glimpse of what we found in our, in our forest canopy survey, in our aerial surveys. Um, so I'm showing every, only the single issues that we mapped that were over 10,000 acres of damage. So there's like 350,000, something like that, acres of mortality. That now this isn't pure mortality. This is acres with you know mappable, visible mortality that we can see thousand feet above the ground, going 100 miles an hour. So this is the 20th year of an eastern March beetle outbreak. Um, you can see most of the damage there in the black areas was was um, is in north central Minnesota. And for some reason my, my computer's bogged down here. I apologize. Um, just a little bit on Eastern March Beetle here since my computer stalled out. Um, University of Minnesota, Department of Entomology professor Brian Alkma has done some, his graduate students have done some very interesting research on Eastern March Beetle. I'm um, showing that the warmer, or actually extended growing seasons that we've experienced for a couple of decades now have enabled the Eastern March Beetle to have two generations per year rather than one which has really helped it um, build its population. Okay, um, we mapped a tremendous amount of spruce budworm again, um, as, as kind of always, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of acres we mapped, but as you can see, it's a tremendous amount in throughout Lake County, Minnesota. This year, it's, it seems from year to year, the spruce budworm um, areas affected by spruce budworm have, have just crept slowly to the east across Minnesota's northeastern Arrowhead region. 
Um, the spruce bugloom, it's a native defoliator. It prefers balsam fir. Um, so it's, you know, this isn't necessarily unusual that we're seeing that. There are a few areas of declining aspen that we map every year. You know, Minnesota has a tremendous amount of aspen. So it's, so we, we map a lot of areas with aspen decline, you know, dieback of aspen is like 30,000 acres. We, ever since, also ever since 2001, we've been mapping damage from larch case bear, which is a non-native defoliator of tamarack, possibly predisposing it to attack by the eastern larch beetle, bark beetle that I showed you before. Um, down here in southeastern Minnesota, now this is accumulated um, acres that we've mapped. We've mapped it in aerial survey now in three different years, 2016, 18, and 21, and we're up to like 10,000 acres of forest with visible scattered ash death from emerald ash borer. Um, and we can't really map oak wilt um, in aerial survey for a variety of reasons, but it's just really hard to do. Um, I think we mapped like 23,000 acres of just three, over just three counties a few years ago. Back in, and then back last year, since we couldn't do aerial survey due to COVID, um, we had one of our employees map out all the oak wilt he could see on 20, on 2019 aerial photo, photography, and he mapped 11,500 spots of oak wilt that you can see here. So there you go. That's um, kind of what minute, what's happening in Minnesota's rural forests. And the snapshot, just to note here, I mean, this looks horrible. It's not like this is 100% effective in all these areas. It, it varies greatly. So um, thanks for listening. I'm sorry about my computer pausings. Um, I'll take any questions if there's any time. If you go to our website here on the bottom, you can find individual um, web pages on like identification and management for a variety of problems like emerald ash, well, burrow blight, oak wilt, um, you know, diplodia, things like that. Our annual reports are a treasure trove of, trove of information and then our newsletters, I think one just came out today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. That was a lot of great information. Um, there were, there's at least one question that has come in and this was from Emily. She wanted to know if you'd heard about more red oaks uh, with oak wilt that did not drop their leaves this year, just wilted and stayed on the tree. They had their trees tested and many that did not look like oak wilt ended up testing positive and also had, I think, bur oak blight. So kind of a combination of things happening there. I didn't hear about that, Emily. Um, I've always wondered though, how oak wilt symptoms vary oh. by time of year and by moisture stress. And I've kind of noticed, now this is just, you know, it, it has no data behind it. It's just my casual observations from for over the course of my career. But it, I, I've just from, you know, working over a broad area, I kind of wonder if oaks that grow in sands, like really sandy soils that start showing oak wilt symptoms later in the growing season, if they have a tendency to hold on to their leaves more rather than rapidly drop them. I've wondered that. Um, and, and this year, I decided as I was driving by Sand Dune State Forest in September, uh, I have some long-term um, kind of oak wilt impact plots there in the woods. And I thought I should go look at what oak wilt symptoms look like in September. And it was pretty remarkable what I saw. Um, I saw, you know, a lot of the pin oaks, they grow, they, they sucker sprout from stumps when they're cut. And so a lot of the oaks, pin oaks there, you'll see a, like a cluster of four. And clearly, you, you, can, you can see that like half of a cluster of four wilted from oak wilt early in the growing season and hardly had any leaves left. And so, some of their, you know, the two remaining oaks that hadn't wilted yet, some of those were, were just changing yellow. They, they were turning yellow. Um, and uh, I, I wonder what would happen to those leaves. 
uh, you know, next year. I, I might go take a peek at them in May and maybe they'll still all be on all on the tree. I don't know. So yeah, that it's, it's an interesting question. Thank you for that. And just to clarify that they did not test positive for burrow blight. I, I mis, misread the question there. Um, there was a, another question that came in. If we could post the link for the newsletter, which I've now done in the chat. So um, that should be there for people to click on and, and save. Um, are there any other questions for Brian? All right. Well, we're close to the end of the hour. Um, Ryan has now posted the link for ISA CEUs. If you're interested in, in those, that's in the chat as well. So make sure you click on that. And we just want to thank Brian again for taking the time. And yeah, even with your computer difficulties, I think there's a lot of great information there. And we really appreciate your, your time and effort to join us today. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of your day.